Wait a second, I got another one in there. <laughs> Over here.
Hunter. Well, they can hear me now. They can hear me now. Well, she said you couldn't hear me, so. are welcomed, members, non-members, anybody who wants to participate that is from five years old up to high school. Still getting words that I can't be heard, so I'm going to yell a little louder for the people in the back. Um, you can contact the church office to get my contact information, to get more information about what we need to be doing on the 18th. So I hope we get a good amount of participation. Try it. How about this? There it goes. <laughs> you're welcome to come sit on stage with me if you need. <laughs> I apologize. There's a lot to coordinate. It's a lot of hair, glasses, ears. All right, we're good. Yes? All right. I remind you that the work of Christ's kingdom requires our faithful reaction to God's love. And one of the ways in which you may express your response is by offering your generous gifts through this church. Um, you may visit the giving station in the back of our worship space this morning. You may visit us online or you may always send your gifts to the church office. But regardless of your response, God is glorified by your giving and we praise God for our abundant blessings. As we move into a season of praying together, I have some particular prayer requests that I'd like to share with you. First of all, um, a little unexpectedly, um, the um, Bobby Barber died last night. Um, he had been, uh, as I mean, we were texting at 5.30 yesterday morning with an expectation of coming home um, and yesterday. And then he took a turn and um, that, that um, continued throughout the day. And then last evening, um, Bobby died and joined the church triumphant. Um, so we, we will mourn that loss, our human loss, but we'll also be excited for his new journey with no struggle to breathe. Um, so he's being completely loved this morning. We also want to remember the family of the child who was hit by the truck yesterday at the Raleigh Christmas Parade. She has died um, as well. So we want to remember that family and community and all of her little dance partners that were there with her and saw that happen. Um, baby Philip is facing a tracheotomy this week. I want to remember him. Um, And here's where I'm struggling this morning. You're, you're about to understand it. I'd like to keep in prayer the people of 249 churches in our North Carolina conference who have walked away from the United Methodist Church. Those decisions were ratified yesterday at our conference and will be effective January the 1st. And folks, my heart is broken. Um, and many of my friends and colleagues are devastated. And yet, as Bishop Fairley reminded us yesterday, we, we don't live in the darkness of Good Friday because we are resurrection people. Um, so may God move us forward in, in love and, and peace and, and in growth. Um, do you have other prayer requests to add? Mary. I'm sure. Yeah. 
Can, can you hear her at all? Yeah, at, at the parade, Mary and her um, grandchildren were at the parade yesterday, and the girls saw the child get hit. Um, and so the family's struggling with witnessing that accident. Are there others? Yeah, Jim. Okay, thank you. Just keep your, both of your family members in prayer. Okay, will you um, pray with me now? Good and giving, Lord, we pray that you would fill us with the knowledge of your will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that together we may live a life worthy of you and in every way pleasing to you. A life in which we bear fruit in every good work and, and acquire strength and endurance and patience and a, and a joyful heart, a heart that gives thanks to you in every situation. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we pray for those who dwell in darkness today and, and for those who are afflicted by the forces of human evil and the schemes of the prince of this world. We pray for all who are oppressed and beaten and forced to submit to others around them both in our land and those in far-off nations. We pray for the children of our world who hunger and thirst and, and those who have no home or place to call their own. We pray for our nation and for all who are in human authority over us and indeed for all nations of our world, that there may be peace with justice within them and, and between them. King Jesus, we pray for those who are broken this day over disagreement and disaffiliation. May the decisions made be, be useful to you in developing your kingdom, for you can create good out of anything. We pray that you hear our praise and our joys for our many blessings. We pray for traveling mercies as so many of us will move from home to home this Thanksgiving week. And, and we offer you thanks knowing that we will eat out of our abundant blessings and the blessing of our abundance. Lord, we also pray for the particular persons and concerns that have been raised before you today and, and for those that we now hold before you in our hearts. In your mercy, O oh Lord, you hear all of our prayers we thank you and we praise you for that and for all that you do. And we pray through Christ Jesus, our Lord and our King, joining our voices together now in the very way you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson, lesson is from Colossians. Lesson is from Colossians. <coughs> I don't remember what I gave y'all. Did I give you Colossians at all? Okay, I'm going to read from Colossians this morning, the first chapter, uh, so you'll, you'll enjoy listening in. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. 
He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, in Paul's time in the first century, the, um, this place of Colossia, this, this town is, is located in a part of the world where people are, are just fascinated with philosophies and theologies and, that are quite different from what Paul is teaching. Now Paul, as we know, is teaching belief in Christ as the Son of God who has complete supremacy. Is the supreme ruler, uh, has complete rule, complete authority, complete power. Now, some influential people in that area, however, are leading the church at Colossia down a very different path. And they're not denying Christ altogether, but they are teaching that Jesus Christ alone is not enough to achieve salvation. Did you hear that? They're teaching Jesus Christ alone is not enough. These people believe that Jesus is just one of many beings who help us to move closer to God. Now, (coughs) excuse me, for us in the United Methodist Church in the 21st century, that seems like an incredibly foreign way of thinking. We absolutely believe that Jesus Christ alone is the only way to salvation. But to the people living just a, a few decades after the resurrection, you know, there remain a lot of questions. And and because of the questions, it becomes easier and easier to kind of introduce new philosophies into the Christian teaching. I know that you've heard me say that you cannot add to the text and you cannot take away from the text. All we have is the text. All we have is scripture. We can wonder, we can ponder, we can discuss, but we cannot change what information we have. And that's what's happening in Colossia. Religious leaders are adding to and taking away from the truth of Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. Um, Religious leaders are combining and replacing Christian beliefs with other religions and other worldviews. Gnosticism is rampant. Do you know that word? You know about the Gnostics? Um, You know, as I study about Gnosticism and I study about the Gnostics, um, I've been reading, and and William Barclay reminds me that the first century Gnostics believe in many gods and believe that the world is created and ruled over by the demiurge. And and that's that's a kind of lesser god, uh, a subordinate of the supreme god, if you will. Um, They believe that Christ is not actually the one true God, but he's just a representative of the supreme God. And that's supreme God with a lowercase g. Okay, So they believe that there's a a mysterious knowledge that is given to a select few people that enables redemption. The Colossia is being inundated with opposition to Jesus as God. um, Opposition to the supremacy of of Christ. The people are being taught that salvation is not made complete through the work of Christ. They're observing rituals and feasts and festivals that go against Christianity. They're worshiping angels. They are claiming false visions. They're making up religious practices. They're teaching that there's a there's a gap between our world and God and that gap is too big for us to cross. And between Almighty God and our universe, they believe there's this spiritual ladder of beings that you have to go through to get to God. So salvation, they believe, is a process of climbing that ladder, um, that spiritual ladder, from one being to the next. And Jesus is just one of the rungs on that spiritual ladder, not the Christ, not the true Son of God. That's what they're teaching. Now, we know at this time that Paul has never actually been to Colossia. Actually, at the time he writes this letter, he's in prison, as he is often, isn't he? Um, Lately, we talk about him being in prison quite a bit. It is possible that he never went there. So so he's never been to their particular area, but he knows of Colossia through some of his friends, and especially through his friend named Epaphras. 
Um, it's, it's this colleague of his, Epaphras, who is the main character in bringing the gospel message to the Colossians. Epaphras, Epaphras heard Paul's teaching and he followed up on hearing that by taking that teaching out into the world. The specific, specific, I can't talk today, specifically to the Colossians. And he is, of course, upset by their understanding and how that's being clouded. You know, this way that they have of figuring out a path to salvation is being fed wrong information. And, and as immature Christians in Colossians, now remember, you know, they, they, Christ died and was resurrected only 30 years before this. So these, these are, the, the, all this information is pretty new to them. They're just learning. And so as, as, as what we would call immature Christians, just learning the truth, they are easy prey to false teachings. Epaphras, Paul's friend, has been very involved with evangelizing the Colossian people. And it's possible that he's actually with Paul when word comes of some problems that the community is having over there. And from what Paul has been told, the church there's thriving, but they're experiencing a time of, well, questioning. Some of the leaders of this community are wondering about the supremacy of Christ, the sovereignty, the authority, the power of Christ. Paul, in his wisdom, recognizes that in spite of the confusion that they're facing, some good understandings are held by the Colossians. And, and he begins this letter that, that we are reading this morning by giving thanks for the ways that they are being obedient to God. And he praises the good things that are happening. And he tells them that he continually prays for them to grow in knowledge and in spiritual maturity. You know, Paul's giving thanks for the Colossians, praying for their continued strength in seeking the truth and stimulating, in his words, he's actually stimulating their thankfulness for what they already have through Jesus Christ. Paul tells them that God, the one true and almighty God, um, has rescued them from darkness. He tells them that they have received their forgiveness of their sins through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then he moves into a, a, a joyous declaration of what Jesus Christ has done for all of us. We look at Jesus and actually see the image of God. We look at Jesus and we recognize that everything began with him. Paul is reminding this new church that Jesus holds everything together, that, that he is the head of the body, that he is first in all things. And in these few sentences of this very short letter, you can go home and read it this afternoon, Paul's preaching the, the foundation of our entire Christian belief system. In this one short letter, everything's there. Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the one who died and was resurrected from the dead so that we might be saved. The Savior of the world who is the complete revelation of God's love for everything created and is the only path to eternal life. The only path. All of creation is meant to be brought together reconciled to God through the, through the faith of Jesus Christ and, and our faith in Jesus Christ. No matter how our life pulls us down, Jesus Christ is the creator of it all, made it all, rules over it all, and can overcome it all. There is power in Jesus Christ. Paul is emphasizing the completeness of Jesus in all things. And as Christian believers, we are called to join in this celebration and shout this good news. There is power in this faith of ours. Folks, Christians have been quiet for a long time on many fronts. But I believe that we're in the fight of our lives right now. We're facing things that are just kind of eating away at the edges of everything that we stand for. And until now, we've sort of, so many times, we've sort of just stood quietly by and, and let things just sort of chip away at our morals and, and, and chip away at, and smooth over our beliefs. We've been told that we don't, we don't really believe in Jesus Christ as king. We don't really believe in Scripture as our primary authority, the Word of God by which we make all our decisions. We've been told that we don't think Mary was really a virgin. Church, none of that's true. 
None of that is true. We, as United Methodist Christians, don't believe anything like that. These are things that I'm actually hearing out in the world about what I'm teaching at this church. I got told that this week. Just this week, someone walked into our church, into this church, and told me what my United Methodist Church stands for, and I was horrified at the misinformation. So let me be clear. Let me be really, really clear this morning. I believe the Bible. Mary was a virgin who gave birth to Jesus Christ, who is my Savior and King, and who is the only path to salvation. And I've got the authority of the inerrant Word of God to back it up. <clears throat> I, I was just thinking, if I don't get an amen on that, I have more work to do than I ever imagined. <laughs> This is a very dangerous path to be on these days. If I am constantly fed a diet of of nothing more than empty calories, I can keep up my energy for a while, but eventually my body is going to begin to struggle. And at some point my life could be in danger. In the same way, if I am constantly fed a diet of bad information, I can keep up my faithfulness for a time, But eventually my understanding of truth is going to struggle. And all of a sudden, I might realize that my very soul is in danger. The good news is it's not too late to change this. It's not too late to take action against it. But we've got to move fast. We really have got to step it up and move fast. We have to get the word out that we are not going to passively sit by and watch our Jesus being taken away from us. After praying for God's guidance, because that's always got to be first, after doing that, we will follow follow Paul's words and claim the joy in our hearts. You know, we will recognize that all things have been created through Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ. There is no ladder of spiritual beings that we have to go through to get to Almighty God. That's not true. Jesus Christ dominates over any ladder that you can come up with, whether that be a ladder of spiritual beings or or climbing up out of your past or feeling as though you can only get to your Savior one rung at a time. It just doesn't work that way. Jesus has provided a direct line to salvation. All the obstacles, all the rungs that you could possibly ever think of have been removed. What a gift we've been given. People of God, we're going to claim that gift. And and we will receive the joy that comes with that claim. And then we're going to engage other people in conversation about the joy that's in us. And we'll show that joy and we'll invite others to join us in that joy. That's what the words of Paul are talking about. That's what you're doing here. You are gaining information. You are developing your understanding. You are gathering the courage to go out into the world and make disciples for your Lord, your King, your Savior, Jesus Christ. On this Christ the King Sunday, we begin the celebration. Give everything to Jesus. Become empowered to do your Lord's will. This is where the changes start. This is where Jesus Christ gives us the instructions to be the people God wants us to be. And then we go out and we tell the story. And and we do the work and we be God's children in all ways. This is where lives are changed. And today you're a part of that change. You are a part of that movement. Be informed. Read your Bible. Know your stuff. Be willing to hear God's voice. Pray. Pray. Pray for your church, pray for your neighbor, pray for yourself. Pray for the churches in our area, the 249 churches in our area who walked away from the United Methodist Church yesterday. Pray for God's blessing on those who remain and on those who left. And in this Thanksgiving season, give thanks to the living God who loves you in spite of all of it, in spite of everything. Give thanks for this world and and for the power of Jesus Christ who rules over this world. Because Jesus Christ not only knows what is coming, Jesus Christ himself is coming. We give thanks on this Christ the King Sunday because this is the day that we pray. Almighty God, you gave your son Jesus Christ a, a realm where all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. Make us loyal followers 
of our living Lord, that we may always hear your word, follow your teachings, and live in your spirit. Even when we can't see the end result, keep us faithful because you see and you rule. You, Jesus, are the King of glory. You are the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And we pray that your kingdom will reign forever in our hearts and in this world, bringing justice, a hope, and grace for all. Thank you for being a different kind of king. And all God's people say, Amen. I've, oh. I just preach to me and let you listen. I'm going to ask that our praise team and our servers join me on the platform at this time. And as they come and we move into such a special time of Holy Communion, I, I remind you that these upcoming moments this morning of communing with God come at no cost to you. you know, there's no need to be a member of this church or any church. There's, there's no need to be baptized. There's no need to meet any requirements that we might impose because this is Christ's table. And Christ invites all of us to come. So in just a few moments, you'll be invited to come with outstretched hands and, and receive from the common loaf of bread, which you will then dip into the common cup. And we do this in remembrance of Christ's offering of his body and his blood so that we might gain eternal life. And if you prefer, a, a basket will be circulated um, with individually sealed bread and cup, and you may remain where you're seated. Um, you're simply invited. So will you continue to pray with me now? I'm going to ask you to go ahead and hold these things. And then we'll break the bread when we pray over it. Thank you. And the cup. Hold the cup. Lord, we lift up our hearts knowing that it's right and good and joyful to give our thanks and praise to you. By your appointment, the seasons come and go. You bring forth bread from the earth and create the fruit of the vine. You formed us in your image and made us stewards of your world. Earth has yielded its treasure and from your hand we've received blessing on blessing. And so we praise you, joining with the saints of every time and place. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and we are thankful. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to the disciples as he said, take, eat. This is my body. He also took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for so many so that their sins may be forgiven. God, as we remember, we join in offering ourselves to you, knowing that your kingdom will come. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ the King comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stay where you are. And then if you'll go down, we'll serve them. table is set. Will you come? This is the Yeah. 
desperate for you. Before you receive the blessing, I remind you that I'll be out of the office this week because I can. <laughs> Y'all owe me two weeks of vacation I hadn't taken yet. <coughs> Got to take those before the end of the year. So if you have an emergency, please call the church office between 9 and 3. Um, or call my cell if you really need me. Um, but I'm going to try to spend some, some time with family this week. I'll be looking forward to seeing you on Saturday at 10. Um, as we decorate this place and prepare for our Hanging of the Greens worship service next Sunday. It's not enough to acclaim Jesus Christ as our Lord and King. Our mission in this life is to make his kingdom a reality among us and to bring it to those around us by our words and our deeds. So the way to do this is to live as he lived for others in love and in service. So may Almighty God bless you for this task. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go in peace to love and serve the Lord, Christ your King, and to give shape to his kingdom. Amen. again.